Okay. No, I put a post out on LinkedIn when this came out um, about a week ago, and I said, I don't know if anybody saw it, if you wanted to bring an object along tonight that you loved, that reminded you of trees, please do so. Did anybody bring anything? Okay, much point there is in LinkedIn, right? <laughs> luckily, luckily I have a few here. So I wanted to share a few things that I have at home. And these are things that I love. Uh, let's start with this. Does anyone know where this is? Hadrian's Wall. S Sycamore Gap, Hadrian's Wall. Before I moved here, I lived within about five miles of this place. And it's stunningly beautiful. Why do you think I like this? <laughs> no. <laughs> what, why do I? What do, do you like it? Yeah. yeah. Would you hang that on your wall? This is above my piano. Um, why? The tree is in the middle. It looks beautiful. It looks architectural. But it also connects us backwards, doesn't it? This is a Roman wall. This is historical. No, the tree hasn't been there since Roman times. But it's an iconic landscape. It sits there. And it's so instantly recognisable. If you're in the northeast of England, everyone knows that Sycamore Gap. So it's iconic, it's our sense of cultural heritage, it connects us back to the past, and it looks beautiful. Those are the things that are important. Now, a few other bits. Other things I like, um, this actually also, this came from a farmer's market. Oh, I'm gonna put that one down, sadly. This came from a farmer's market, not very far away, also in the northeast of England. I'm just going to double check, 01670, so that's just down near Morpeth. And this comes from, here, yeah, might actually have told me, this is a guy cut, yeah, this is burr elm wood. And this guy cuts these and creates sculptures from them. So he cuts this to get the grain, but what I love is the back. It's the fact that you've got that texture you see there, you get this sense of where it comes from. And you've got that on the front. And actually, the, the design is almost neither here nor there. The beauty is in what's behind it and how he's cut through the burr on it as well. So, so I just love that. A third one is this. Very different tree. This is an African landscape. So this is, and I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, but it's a baobab tree. And you see these all across southern and central Africa. Again, they're iconic to that region. Why do I like this? It's colourful. It reminds me of many holidays. Well, actually not really holidays, mostly business trips that I've had to that part of the world. And it reminds me of all the wildlife and everything else that goes around that. There's, you know, sort of silhouettes of giraffes and things there, but it just conjures up the whole thing. It's a memory. It reminds me. So the things that I have at home that are related to trees are about culture, they're about appearance, they're about heritage, they're about all of those things. What do you think is important? You're, you're all here because you're interested, presumably, in some shape or form in trees. So what's important to you about trees? apart from the things that I've mentioned. What else is important? Apples, Apples fruit, <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Wildlife. Someone said wildlife. wildlife, yeah, wildlife, biodiversity. I couldn't get a copy, but what I really wanted was to bring along the Percy the Park Keeper book. Have any of you seen it with the three-year-olds? And you get to the last page and you discover that this tree is a home for all these wonderful animals. Yeah, really important biodiversity contribution both for the wildlife, but also for the insects and the um, smaller things on it. Anything else? I'd like to pick up a dead piece of branch to put it on my legacy and show that it's just like being beautiful. Yeah. And it connects you back. My, my father was a wood machinist, um, and he grew up, um, he was, di was did an apprenticeship, and he was down in the shipyard in Belfast, um, taking the logs that were coming in off the boat and machining them through. And I used to go down on a Saturday morning and see what was the residues of that alongside it. You yeah, see the same the ocean. Yeah. yeah. And the sawdust from it. Yeah. Atmospheric. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
and it's that biodiversity. But what, what, what do you mean by connection with the soil? Do you mean... Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Microclimate. 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 Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, they, they shelter, they mm -hmm. shelter, um, they help to sort of regulate um, the mortality cycle. Yep. So, so they have a local cooling effect um, because the because of the leaves. The leaves are able to um, take these in um, and create a cooling effect. But you also have the canopy effect of the shade and what that creates underneath. Yeah. 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 And you see that again up in the northeast, um, not very far there from Sycamore Gap. You have loads of areas of land where you have these shelter belts where people have just planted trees in order to protect the area downstream um, to make those fields more useful. Anything else? Climbing trees that aren't mm, Yes, recreation and having fun and swings off them and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's at the top of Ravensgate Common where we've got one. No, it's at Campton Hill where we have one with the big rope off it where you can go and swing on. Anything else? We need to build up the windmill Yes, I've got two hands up at the back and then Mental health is huge on this and the evidence around going for a walk in wooded areas is massive. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, we've got two more. Construction. Construction industry and using them. And I will share, because Felicity mentioned, um, I sit on several government boards and one of them is DEFRA's Tree and Woodland Scientific Advisory Group. And the first time I ever went to one of their meetings, we were presented with the England Tree Action Plan and we were told that we were going to plant all these trees. And I looked and I said, sorry, what are these trees for? And they said, well, they're trees. <laughs> and I'm saying, well, what are you going to use them for? And that's really important for the construction industry to get the right type of tree. Um, to provide the wood that we actually need. I think there was one more here, maybe. Just in relation to oaks, I love the idea that you don't plant an oak for yourself, you plant it for your grandchildren. In future, absolutely. And th this is a really important concept that we will come back to later. That I think one of the reasons that trees are so special to us, it's a bit like when I look at wildlife, and it's hard to get excited about a slow worm, but boy, is it easy to get excited about an elephant. <laughs> okay, sorry, just me. <laughs> You know, but w we have animals that have long lifespans. Things that last longer than us are, are things that we respect and we think about them differently. And that is the case with the oak tree. And I think that creates a sense of respect that this has been here before us, it will be here after us, it outlasts us. And therefore we should have a respect for it. So you're all people who live locally here. We have these meetings once a month. And we have them mostly to focus on climate change. And we even said tonight we were going to talk about climate change. And yet not one of you have mentioned the magic word. Carbon. Hasn't been said. You see, I'm going to put it to you that we talk about trees doing carbon. But actually, we just like trees. We just like having them. And the notion that they will sequester carbon at the same time is rather a handy thing to be able to hang off the end of it and say, oh yeah, that's why I'm doing it. That's why it's valuable. Actually, we just like them. They're part of us, they're connected to us. And I think that's okay. I don't have a problem with that. But, as we will talk later, it can create a tension. Because the conversation we were having earlier, if you're really trying to do carbon, you might want to plant a certain type of tree in a certain way and manage it in a certain way that might be different to if your primary function is to create something for shooting or to create something for recreational purposes or to create something for biodiversity. So forests are the most wonderful multifunctional land uses when I was at COP26 last year, I think I told some of you in this room a week or two later that I ended up on the same panel as a Canadian forester. And she said um, that she studied forestry, um, PhD, 
and her supervisor of her PhD said that he studied forestry. First, he was a scientist. He was a rocket scientist at NASA. He said, but rocket science is actually quite easy. And I sympathise with this. I'm a physicist. He said, you do the calculation, it goes up and it comes down. It's all very predictable. Forestry, there, you're balancing biodiversity, you're balancing carbon, you're balancing ecosystem impacts, you're val balancing visual impacts, you're looking at different, multiple different types of impacts, and you've got value judgments around how to weigh those all up. This is seriously complex stuff. This is, frankly, a profession that is massively underrated, in my opinion. And there you have the complexity around how should we use our land? How should we manage our land um, played out straight in front of us? So forestry is not straightforward. It's not all about carbon. We are going to talk a lot about carbon tonight, but I think it's just important that we start by recognising that trees are about an awful lot more than carbon. One that we didn't, I, I'm just doing my cross check here on things that we didn't mention. We did talk about um, air and local cooling effect. We didn't talk about the fact that the leaves actually also filter out particulates in the air. We didn't talk about the fact that they have the roots have hydrological impacts. And particularly if you have flood zones, it can be really helpful to plant certain types of tree um, in the right place. Um, and the issue of the saplings dying is what happens when we plant the wrong trees in the wrong place. So that's where we start from. But I am now going to home in on carbon. Let's get the right slide here. <coughs> I don't have many slides for you. And I promise you this will be the single most complicated one you will see all night. <coughs> right. This is the one I want. Let me full screen it. Okay. This is some work I did about 10, oh, it says 2019. It wasn't that long ago. Okay, when I was up at University of Manchester. These are three different forests in three different parts of the world. What I am plotting here is the total carbon stock. And that's the carbon that's stored in the trunk of the tree and in all its branches, but also added on top of that, um, the carbon that's in the soil the carbon that's in the harvested material that will be taken off for different uses and the, uh, have I got anything else on there? No, that's it. So this is summing up all of the carbon. These are in three different parts of the world. And I'm going to try and remember because I seem to have pulled this out without what was what. The one on the bottom is the UK and that is a mature broadleaf. So that is an oak or similar um, and you can see that that is being done on a 75-year rotation span. The one in the middle, I'm just trying to remember which is which, I think the one in the middle is lobbly pine, and I think the one up, no, the one in the middle is eucalyptus, that's why it's got the thinning in the middle, um, which is in South America in that particular case, and the one up the top is um, lobbly pine in Canada. Canada. So this was done by three different research groups in three different parts of the world, all looking at the same thing and using this to compare. And what we're plotting is the carbon, and we're going through, these are commercial forests, so we're going through and we're cutting them down when they get to the point that we actually want to use them. What you see, um, there's a few points to make. The first thing is that the carbon increase is steepest in the earliest parts of the tree lifetime, okay? By the time this oak tree gets to here, year on year, the uptake of carbon is actually quite low. So by the time your tree is mature, it's actually not taking up a huge amount of carbon by keeping it there. The second thing to notice is that there are some differences in the total. So this is peaking out at about 700. That one's peaking at 1,000. But you can see that the average, the mean along here, is going to be about 500 for that one. Oh, look, lo and behold, it's going to be about 500 there. That top one's going to be a bit lower. So you do get variations on the mean or average carbon stock over the lifetime of multiple cycles, but they're not massive. And the really important thing about all of these graphs is that 
you see these huge sharp variations every time you harvest. So all those vertical lines coming down are when we're cutting trees down and we're using them for something useful. And at that point you're losing material. But because it regrows again, what's important over a long time period is actually the average. Now, we were talking about climate change. Climate change is a problem that's been going on since the Industrial Revolution, so 150, 200 years. The differences that you see on those short cycles for eucalyptus every 10 to 20 years are not significant over a time span where we're actually aiming to make a difference over 150 or 200 years. What is important is that we have that high carbon stock on average and therefore what that equates to is keeping land under forest cover. This is why it's important if the Amazon has been deforested. If there's a reduction in the area of forested land, then we have a problem. But actually felling a particular area, as long as it is replanted, is not actually reducing the carbon stock over that area of land and over the planet in the long term. Another way of thinking of it is imagine if every one of you here this evening were to live forever. How crowded <laughs> would Chart and Kings become? And that's what this is equivalent to. The notion that we keep trees in perpetuity is equivalent to that. It's equivalent to saying, let's keep things forever. It doesn't allow for new growth. And if you don't free up that area of land to plant something new, then you can't get that really fast uptake of carbon at the start, okay? This is a really almost counterintuitive concept because most people see big trees and they think, hey, we need to keep that there, we need to preserve it. Well, yes, if we're interested in the appearance and the biodiversity, but there are trade-offs here. And for carbon purposes and climate purposes, that's not necessarily the case. Okay, so da -da 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 -da, make sure I'm covering everything here. Um, yeah, so what happens when we chop the tree down? That then becomes critical. And we talked earlier about the construction industry in this respect. If I can chop a tree and I can use it, and let's be honest, a lot of the forests in Europe actually, and indeed South America, actually grew up around the need for timber for things like railway sleepers. And if I can lock that up in construction of homes, or other mechanisms that actually are going to keep it on the planet, then I've actually removed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The tree has taken it in, it has put it there, I have used it for furniture or whatever, and as long as I keep that in the ecosphere, it's trapped and I've locked it, okay? We may later have to worry about what happens when it gets re-released, but for the period that it is in use, it is locked up, and that's why the best uses are the ones that last longest. Hence the construction industry and quality furniture, not chipboard from Ikea, which, you know, we know how long that lasts. So when I look at all of this, I could argue, if I showed you just a snapshot, if I showed you just that, I could stand and have an argument and I could say, look, the carbon on this plot of land was increasing. And then these horrible people came along and they chop the trees down and look, it's devastated. But that would be only showing part of the picture. So it's really, really important that we frame our problems in a proper time scale and think about them in that proper time scale. And I always have a few analogies that I use here to help through with this. The, the first thing to realise is that when I look at that, it is a cycle. That's a circle. So there is no unique vantage point that you can pick and say, ah, let's start there, and then I'll call it a carbon debt. Let's start there, and I'll call it a carbon sequestration and in uptake from atmosphere. You've got to look over the long term. You've got to look at multiple cycles. 
Um, and the analogy that I use here, because again, it's difficult for us to conceive of this because the trees are lasting longer than we are. And the analogy that I use is that if you are going to walk in a circle, it actually doesn't matter where you start because you always get back to the same place. So if it is your intention to continue to keep this land forested and to continue with more cycles of growth and cutting and growth and cutting, it actually doesn't matter where on that graph you claim is your starting point. And this is the argument that we get, and there has been a little bit of this in the press recently, about the notion of carbon debt, that we've created a debt by cutting trees down. We need to be really, really careful. If we have reduced the forested area, we have created a debt. If we have cut a tree down and done something useful with it, I would argue that we haven't. Right. What I've shown you here, different species have different rotation lengths and different mean carbon stocks, but there are trade-offs. We talked about carbon, but earlier on we talked about biodiversity and all that stuff as well. Let me get a picture that some of you may recognise. <coughs> yes, I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. Because of the soil and the roots, um, you, you cut off at the stump. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, and one of the interesting things here is that what you create is, so you're transferring the carbon into the main bit of the tree. The carbon is then transferring via the roots into the soil. So you're actually enriching the carbon content in the soil nearby, but most of that is organic carbon. So if you then cut the trees down and you were to ply the land up, you would actually release a lot of that carbon back to atmosphere again. Over the long term, as in those multiple cycles, some of that carbon in the soil will actually mineralise and then it doesn't get re-released and when you ply it up. The proportion of that that actually happens depends on the tree type um, and depends particularly on the agroecological zone that you're in, so where in the world you are, um, as to how quickly that will happen and how quickly you lose carbon again. Um, but th that's why we did this in with three different <coughs> research centres in three different parts of the world who knew their local climate and their local trees. Right, so how many people in this room watched the Panorama programme the other week? Come on, it must have been more than that. I'm sure that plenty of you watched and, so and were horrified at the BBC trailing you, you, you guys didn't see it, the BBC trailing the wood plantations which come to Drax Power Station. Yes, <laughs> that was Panorama. So that is one of the photographs from the BBC website. This is the deforested area, it says in the bottom, BBC Panorama visited the British Columbian forest. Have any of you ever been to BC, to British Columbia in Canada? What are the forests like? Fantastic. Fantastic. Any other words? Dense, massive. massive, vast. You can go for miles and see nothing else. Now, I've only been once. And when I was there, it was a year when there were really, really bad wildfires. And we were in a motor home. We were going through um, from Calgary um, to Vancouver. And as we were going through, every night you stopped. No fires, not allowed to do this because th the wildfires were taking place everywhere. So it's a really sensitive landscape, but the other thing that had struck that year was, I'm gonna get this the wrong way around, I can never remember whether it's mountain pine beetle or pine mountain beetle, but the beetle had struck. And therefore there were huge areas where um, it had been devastated by wildfire, and there were huge areas where it had been devastated um, by the pest. Now, why am I telling you this? There are lots of things that cause natural disturbances in forests. One of the issues with climate change is that as we get warmer, some of these things will become more frequent. So some of the pests we will become more susceptible to in these different forests. The wildfires are a huge issue. Believe it or not, in my day job, I'm having conversations at the moment with some insurance industries in the US who are particularly worried about wildfires in their insured forests. Um, and the t potential liability that they might have to pay out on these in the future and how frequently is this going to happen now. This was the photograph that Panorama showed and they claimed um, that one square mile of Canadian forest 
had been felled. They kept saying this was primary forest. Primary forest is a really difficult definition. In the UK, we tend to use it to mean stuff that's been around for a few hundred years, sort of earlier than 1600 or so. But it is a term that is used differently in different parts of the world. Um, so we need to be careful with things like that. But the question was, why did this happen? Now, as it happened, I had a class of master's students that day, and I hadn't seen the programme. I said to the master's students, please watch this tonight, and please do so to develop your critical thinking skills. I want you to watch it, and I want you to see what evidence have I been presented, what can I conclude, and what can I not conclude? Okay? Now, look at that. And it looks horrible, doesn't it? It's, you know, it, it's a crime against nature. It's all these things that we don't want. It's trees cutting down. It looks pretty ugly. Why would anyone do that? People who watched Panorama, you, you know what they said. For profit. They said it was for profit, yeah. It was for timber. It was for timber which can amount to the same thing because the saw log itself is pretty valuable stuff. It can be a few hundred quid a tonne. So the argument was that it was for money. But we didn't actually see any evidence of that, did we? Why else might it have happened? Why else might someone have cut down a square mile of forest? Firebreak. Which they were pretty clear there was a logging license for. Firebreak. Firebreak, yeah. I mentioned earlier the Canadian forests are particularly prone to that. Anything Blood else? Prevention. Blood prevention. For the purposes of replanting. Purposes of replanting for harvesting. Yeah. So, and, and the, the one I mentioned earlier, the pests, the pine mountain beetle. So, if you get that infesting an area then you tend to need to go a reasonable area around that in order to make sure you've eradicated it before you move on to something else. So there's all sorts of reasons why this might have happened. And someone said near the start, profit or money or something, someone said that. Yeah, but I'm going to suggest that maybe, just maybe, it might have been for people who actually own the land to get some return on it. Because one of the things that really bothers me about forests and our attitude to them is that we all love them and we all want them. None of us are prepared to pay for them. We expect them to be free and we expect them to be there forever. And if I own a piece of land and if I'm an indigenous community, then I may be very in tune with this and I may be managing it in a perfectly sensible way. It can still look pretty ugly when you actually try to access that. So we, we need to be careful about making judgments and assumptions about other people and what they're doing to their land and what right they have to do it to the land. A lot of the UK's forests, you, we have got the Forestry Commission, but beyond the national parks, a lot of the UK's forests and woodland are on private land. And people put them there on their own land with their own money because they want them there for all the reasons we talked about at the start. Yeah, yeah, and, and I could show you another photograph that's not a million miles from here that looks very similar as well. It, it looks ugly, it always looks ugly when you cut trees down, but it's part of that cycle. You've got to remember the graph. It's on that dip so that we can sequester more carbon. You don't cut it down, you can't return to that really fast carbon uptake. So this is important to remember. What have I got on here? Da, da, da. So, so let's talk Drax and Panorama. Um, the simple answer is that from what the BBC showed that evening, I had a conversation with my students afterwards and we concluded that we didn't know why that forest had been cut down. There's no paperwork that showed why. We knew there was a logging licence granted by the Canadian Authority for one square mile. It did, they did not tell us why. They would have had to have stated the reason in order to gain that license, but we weren't told what it was. Um, and there just wasn't any evidence. Now, if, as one of you suggested, this might have been cut down in order to plant more trees, then that's actually called sustainable forestry. 
So we don't know what was going on. I don't feel there was anywhere near enough information given. And I'm going to remind you of a definition of sustainability that we've given many times before. That sustainability is about meeting the needs of today's generations without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. Now, is cutting down a forest at the peak of its natural cycle to access, even if it was for money, the profit from the lumber, is that sustainable if you're going to replant it? I would say no. Okay, because? Because of, uh, not because of the um, carbon or anything like that, but because of the loss of wildlife habitat, so we're talking about ancient forests or, as I said before, somewhere else in the region, the farm woods, and uh, wildlife areas. So from that perspective, sustainability is good. Why is this going to cut the area? Is it really sustainable? So, so that is true for the very small um, level species for insects and so on. Um, which you lose at that point, the larger animals tend to move to the area nearby. So if you're cutting down, as they did here, one square mile, what will actually happen is they will drift across, uh, and as it regrows, they will come back again. You also find that you get different types of biodiversity at different ages in a plantation, um, and, and that will make a difference as well. I, I'm going to say that that is true when we are dealing with deforestation, where we are reducing the net area of forest. If we're keeping the net area the same and are cutting down a section in order to replant, I think that's slightly different. And I take your point on orangutans, and, and actually we can argue that so, so that's palm um, plantations, mostly in Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, so I think that there's a double-edged sword here that we need to think about very carefully and we need to view... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I actually have a chainsaw up my side and cut down trees and I've just grown this herb. Uh, but well, well, I haven't seen the documentary, but I do know at times um, Dave Mackay had a lot of problems with what was going on procedurally. Mm. What you tell me to Colombia, the yeah. problem there is that he had which was in the States. Southeastern US, and yeah. So, you know, fine, we don't know about that, but in the States, they had clear cutting regeneration there would be nil because there's no time mm -hmm. for replanting. There was also actually revitalization in terms of producing wood chippings of much bigger sorts of animals. So when you were trying to describe, as, as, as Dave was saying, you were trying to calculate, so this is actually a problem. You were actually thinking of the wrong area. I don't know. I didn't see the documentary. I don't know about the documentary. Yeah, so, so the BBC focused on British Columbia, which is why I used it. The work that we did a few years ago and the graph that I had um, was British Columbia. Um, Drax does take from British Columbia, um, but the majority, as you say, is in the southeastern US. I don't actually think the argument is that different, but, but let's, let's le leave that for now. Um, where were we? Sustainability, blah, 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 blah. Um, okay, so I think that, and we've talked before here as well at the groups that we've had um, in Charlton Kings about sustainability having multiple dimensions environmental, economic and social and it being this constant balancing act. And I think forestry is a really good example of that, where you need to balance around it um, in order to get the optimum out of it. And it's again the time scale over which you're looking at. So it's important to look at the correct time scale. It's also important to look at the correct spatial scale now. If I can make this work, um, I have a video at this point. Oh sorry, spatial scale, right. So this is the aerial photo um, in the panorama. I just picked this off the BBC website this afternoon. So the area where the deforestation was, was here. Um, but I just show this to put this in perspective that we actually have a vast area of forest here. And we have an area of it that has been deforested, but <coughs> it's within a huge um, wider landscape. And we need to look at things, I think, at a landscape scale. Are there other areas? Okay, so that's to try and visualise things and also to try and show the different spatial and some, someone said, you know, are those other areas that have been deforested? Probably yes, probably haven't grown again or may look a different colour because they're earlier growth um, with different, you know, sort of level of tree canopy at that point. So 
da, 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 da. it's important to look over the right time scale. It's important to look over the right spatial scale. I want to finish off by taking this back um, to something a bit closer to home. How many of you have ever been to Line Over Woods? Yeah, yeah. okay. We, we like Line Over Woods, don't we? Right, let me have a little look. And find a different document here. It's the one called Line Over, unsurprisingly. Okay, so what we were making a fuss about earlier was one square mile of forest in British Columbia. This is the forest management plan for line over. You can see here that at one point in time, in 2020, we actually had 16 hectares that we were going to thin. That's cut down. And we are taking the material for that. If you walk through line over, you will often see to one side logs that have been put there labelled for sale or purchase to particular uses. I think that's fine. It's within the forest cycle. It's being used for useful products. It's giving income to the people who own it and who sustainably manage it. And that's why it's there for us to walk around and to provide the wildlife habitats that we all appreciate. So I think it's important to keep this in perspective. If we're accepting that it's okay to do that in local woodland here and to thin areas like that, why would it not be okay to do it in Canada? We've got to look at what the objectives are and what the best plan is overall for the entire forest. And frankly, I do, I do tend to come back and say we need to trust experts a bit more. Foresters are well-trained people. I have yet to meet foresters who are in it for the money, frankly. It's not something that is brilliantly paid. Most of them are in it because they love trees, they love wildlife, and they want to make a difference. So I trust them to put in place management plans that are sensible. And yes, we may have issues where we have big industries buying up areas of land, but if we are keeping a forested area of land and we have reasonable management plans in place, then I'm reasonably okay with that. With line over, yep. um, the great proportion of the contours were planted uh, after the war uh, because it was a quick crop. Yes. The, 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 um, and before the uh, Woodland Trust bought the uh, line over, it was managed by Teddy Trent, and their intention was to actually proliferate quite a lot of the broadleaf woodland. I didn't know that, okay. Yeah, uh, so in 1986, they bought the, um, the wood off uh, Ted and Trent uh, because Mrs. Thatcher was getting rid of mm. utilities, um, which in a way uh, was good for us. Um, but the actual na native broadleaf woodland um, is, is that sustainable, um, and we, we want biodiversity, so we've got lots of species which we, uh, any seedlings we plant back in mm. there. Um, the actual, but the actual trees, the, the uh, contours, um, they aren't actually the Woodland Trust that was going to leave some yeah, of the um, Western Oak Cedar yeah. and some of the other trees to go on to over maturity. But they're, they're not, their intention is to um, actually um, restore it to the broadleaf woodland. That, that's what it was, those native broadleaf woodlands. A lot of the trees, the uh, oak, that's many right. hundreds of years yep. ago, uh, and you'll see that there's lots of nice um, branches of oak left. Our biggest problem as a world stand between our young oak trees. Uh, and one of the reasons the UK has some of the forests it does was in order to provide the needs of the Admiralty in the days when we were seeking empire. Um, that, that was what a lot of it was actually used for. But I just show this up to keep things in perspective, that all forests need management plans. These management plans, if the forest is sustainably certified, these are put in the public domain, everyone can see them and you can inspect them and they are deemed sustainable, okay? Now, I could have a very long conversation about FSC certification and other schemes that probably most people wouldn't be that interested in, but I, I just wanna sort of finish up with a few points and then we can open up into more questions. I think we've talked a lot tonight about carbon 
carbon is incredibly important. It's often used as the reason for doing trees and for encouraging trees, but actually, I think often we do it for a whole host of other reasons. That's okay. There's more to life than carbon. Biodiversity is incredibly important. Hydrology is important. Air quality is important. Lots of things are. But when we think about these problems, and particularly about the carbon problem, we've got to transpose our thinking to the correct scale, to the correct time scale, and not get foiled by the fact that the trees are there for longer than us. Actually, do the calculations and work it through. You've got to get the timing right, and you've got to get the scale of the activity right, and accept that it's OK to have fully mature trees in one part of a forest while you have newer trees elsewhere. It's actually healthy to have a range of different age classes um, across it. What is beyond important is that we keep the area of forest that we have on the planet. We need all of that. Ideally, we would increase that. We can't be continuing to have, you know, expansion of plantations for soy and other things in South America infringing on the Amazon. We can't be continuing to see some of what's happening in terms of desertification in China and Eastern Asia where we're losing forest. That that is untenable. But cutting trees down that have been designed to deliver wood products is not the same as deforestation. And it's really important to understand that. So I think there are ways to manage all of this that are climate friendly. They may not look pretty and they may be a little bit counterintuitive, but we've got to stand back and think, what do we really want here? What are the objectives and what are we getting? We will get what we want. And the case was made earlier that I think it was you said about line over that, you know, we put coniferous um, material in post Second World War in order to get things built quickly. We did exactly the same up in Northumberland. That's why we've got Kielder Forest. Mm -hmm. Kielder Forest is fabulous. Mm -hmm. Red squirrels. It's, it's an incredible place. Osprey. But that's what it came from. It came from those really dense coniferous plantations. So there are pros and cons here that that may not be native species and it may not be giving us, you know, what we'd get down here with oak, but actually up there, it's much better for the local climate and it does give us quite valuable um, biodiversity. So that's it. That's all I have to <laughs> say on climate um, and trees, but very happy to enter into any discussions about that because it is a hugely complex area. It really, really is. Thank you. <laughs>